Don't stop firing! I think I'm being followed. My dad is turning green, like, literally green. My last nav check put me at the Grange Point 4. This is Control, we are radio. Keep calm and remain on the guard frequency. Sits and sieves, captains and commanders, you're tuned to the guard frequency. And as all good pilots know, when you're out in the deep black, you want to keep one ear on the guard. This is episode 166 of the Best Damn Space Sim podcast ever, and was recorded on Friday, April 28th, and made available for download Tuesday, May 2nd, over at guardfrequency.com. I'm Ostron. I'm Jeff. And I'm Ken Shadow. Henry unfortunately couldn't join us tonight, so instead we dragged our resident lawyer and master of soapbox oration, Tony. So what do you have in this week, Ken Shadow? In this week's Squawk Box, Trappist-1 may be throwing its life forms all over the place. Next, we hit the flight deck and see what news from your favorite space sims has landed as we cover more Banu and Defender news from Star Citizen. Then a minor controversy, some updates, and a big new discovery in Elite Dangerous. Finally, we tune into the feedback loop and let you join in the conversation. That takes care of the housekeeping, so let's get on with the show and see what's coming through the squad box. Any of you boys need a carrier around here? Uh, everything's under control. Situation normal. Crypto, crypto, crypto. This is Jeff saying welcome to the Squawk Box, everyone. The Trappist-1 system was a big deal when it was discovered, both for space and space sim enthusiasts. For those who don't remember, the system in question was confirmed to have seven planets and a whopping three in the so-called Goldilocks zone, greatly increasing the chances of life developing there. Consequently, at the time, it was discovered that the universe generator and Elite had created a planetary system that closely approximated the real one. Now, some scientists have suggested that TRAPPIST-1 may be engaging in frat boy behavior with its life forms, if there are any. Apparently, the proximity and number of potentially habitable planets in TRAPPIST-1 allows for the process called fast lithopanspermia. The theory behind lithopanspermia is basically the excuse that Star Trek used in The Next Generation to explain why all the aliens in this show were humanoid. Examples of life from a planet that got ejected from said planet on debris generated from implacts or other events. The life persists on those rocks and then ends up in another planet where the debris does. Normally, this is highly unlikely. First, the life form has to be able to survive getting ejected into space and living on a piece of rock without atmosphere for however many years it takes to get to another planet. Then, they have to hope that the planet their rock lands on is capable of supporting life. In our solar system, for example, chances are slim. However, in TRAPPIST-1, not only is it more likely that a random rock will hit a habitable planet, it can also do much quicker than usual. Simulations the scientists ran estimated that a rock ejected from one of the habitable planets might make a journey in as short as 10 years to get to one of the other habitable TRAPPIST planets. That's still a long time to bake unprotected in radiation from a star and whatever else is in the system, but it's better odds that they're going to get anywhere else. So, if or when we finally get there and find some nine-legged mega badgers that are present on all three planets, you listeners will know why. So, yeah, I mean, ten years is still a long time, but since we're talking astronomical measurements, it's shorter than the average. Well, it was also theorized uh, that meteorites... Okay, there's a difference between comets and meteorites. That debris ejected from meteor or comets, and they're usually um, surrounded by some corona of some, uh, you know, gas that's being expelled from the gas, that the ice itself could shelter bacteria, and if it breaks off and lands on a planet, then you've got, you know, a viable <laughs> breeding ground, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. It would, it would be interesting to see what kind of life that would be able to survive because it's not like nine-legged mega badgers are taking rock, how rides on these rocks. It would be some very extremophile bacteria or something like that. And so, whereas the planet it left from might have a great genetic diversity that led to the ability to produce this uh, extremophile that would then survive on the rock, this extremophile would be the basis of life on a new planet. For instance, if you had an extremophile that is based around volcanoes, and 
it is ejected into space because of a mega volcano or something like that, and then hitches a ride on this these celestial winds to get to another planet. What kind of life would then? What, what kind of complex life would then evolve from an extremophile um, that was injected in such a way? It's an interesting thought experiment. Well, i you know I, I I remember the episode where they explained this on on uh, TNG, but uh, I always like the theory myself that we are genetic codes from beings over a couple billion years old, and that uh, they just seeded the universe. Well, that that was TNG's thing, right? That they they seeded the DNA that created all these bipeds. Yeah, that was the in very broad strokes. That was the yeah. Excuse. It was the preservers uh, storyline. Uh, again, our lingua franca here at the show, Star Trek Online. They continued that storyline in the video game as well. Ancient civilization preserving their genetic heritage by Johnny Apple seeding everything all over the damn place. I, I kind of like that theory. It makes sense to me. It sounds like a plan. We should do that. Absolutely. And everybody in the universe uh, in, in a couple billion years will have you know uh, lustrous. Beards, uh, such as uh, such as you know, seen on some of the members of Guard Frequency, and uh, it uh, will have uh, you know, the, a, a genetic descendants uh, with with fine facial hair instead of bumpy foreheads like on Star Trek. Our, our descendants will have nice beards. Presenters will be the known as the bearded ones. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just throw a recording of uh, of this podcast in with the the time in, in with the DNA that we launched. We'll encode it in the DNA. Uh, samples. Yes, that's a good idea. So we'll go. know exactly. They'll know exactly who to blame for their genetic uh, heritage. Read, seen, or heard something you might think is interesting to others listening on the spectrum? Send an email to squawk at guardfrequency dot com. But for now, let's see what news has hit the flight deck. Three one seven five Port Bay hands on approach. Checker screen. Call the ball. Don't get technical with me. Lots of energy from Star Citizen was still being put on the Defender this past week, most likely because of the sale. Early in the week, the subscriber Town Hall, which was officially focused on alien race development with the writing staff, took time out to explicitly clarify some things about the Defender. Specifically, as we guessed last week, the specs posted online do not reflect the realities of the ship. The shield should be a size 2 and there should be two power plants. In the future, the devs will be displaying some ideas that they have for cockpit visibility to address concerns about the forward-facing pylons. They also clarified that the weapons on the gimbal mounts can be an S2, or they can be swapped out for fixed S3 weapons. Also, the custom alien components on the ship, namely the Tabarian shields, the Xeon engine, and the new Tachyon cannon weapons, can be swapped out for conventional parts. To supplement those snippets, the Defender Q&A came out on Thursday with several of the questions reiterating the information covered in the Town Hall. The answers revealed that the Defender is going to be a longer range fighter than average for its size, although it won't have substantial cargo space due to the Banu specialization philosophy. All of the cargo hauling is left to the merchantman. As a combatant, the Defender relies on maneuverability and its long-range weapons to protect its charges. The idea is that the attackers will have the choice of expending time chasing down the maneuverable ship or suffer the constant long-range fire while trying to attack whatever the Defender is escorting. In a straight-up brawl, the Defender is not expected to come out on top against something like a Super Hornet or a Saber, although it will slightly edge out the Saber in speed and maneuverability. It also has an actual cabin with access to some components, so in-flight repairs will be more feasible than with other fighters. The non-defender segments of the town hall focus more on the Banu lore and how they would affect the game. Several aspects of the Banu haven't been worked out yet, such as their language and personal weapons, but there was more to share than what was initially came through last week, including some details of Banu child rearing and families. There will be Banu landing zones eventually, but those aren't in development yet. Also, owning a Defender or Merchantman won't grant any particular advantages in traveling through Banu space, as most Banu don't have a problem with humans or the UEE, although there have been individual exceptions. Also, shopping with the Banu may provide unique opportunities, as it is possible they will carry Vandul merchandise. So that last bit sort of intrigued me, because I wasn't quite sure what Vandul merchandise would be. So there are Vandal ship parts and things like that. Um, there, you, so they've talked about the Vandal technology a bit in that it's it is built from scavenged parts, but it isn't scavenged parts itself. 
So for instance, if you have a Glaive or Scythe right now, they have unique Vandua weapons and engine modifiers and things like that that you can't really swap out because they're they're custom. And so if you have a Vandal ship and you need new Vandal weapons, then maybe you go to a Banu merchant to get uh, replacement parts for that Vandal ship. Uh, similarly, uh, we haven't seen what the Vandal will do in ground-to-ground combat, so maybe they have cool armor or weapons that they use there, too, that you could potentially purchase. There were a bunch of little ideas kind of being thrown around around the Defender's visibility issue in the cast. And, I mean, they even mentioned the idea of potentially relocating those arms jutting out. Maybe they swing to the side or, or something like that. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see what they actually come up with to solve the visibility problem. Isn't that the sort of thing that you'd catch at the concepting phase, usually? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I- I think I think of you know th- that that sort of twin arm look is I mean it's been done before I mean the Rizian Corvette in Star Trek Online the the Cylon Raider from Battlestar Galactica the reboot even the Jedi fighter from uh, the third one the one that actually was not terrible Sith Revenge of the Sith yeah and they usually they usually solve that by sticking the cockpit above the right. elliptical plane right? right right you know the, the the arms are below and then the the cockpit is above. They even did it in uh, Wing Commander with the old Drawthai fighter. Yeah, those don't really come forward all the way in that. But, but I mean, this is the sort of thing where you think that would, this would be in the concept phase is that somebody would imagine themselves in the pilot in the in the seat and go, "Yeah, I'm in my new cool fighter, and I can't see ninety degrees to my right. There's <laughs> there's a wall of steel there." The weird thing about that is that Chris Roberts in the jump point like points this out, saying this is going to be a problem. Right. And then the designer during the live cast said, yeah, we knew it. And we were already brainstorming ways to fix this. And it sounded like they had an idea and they just kind of ran with it and contracted the artists and stuff like that to go, even though they hadn't sorted all the problems out with the ship. And, you know, they went ahead and just did the sale because it's part of the pipeline. Maybe there was some confusion on the back end because as a Banu ship, maybe people were thinking, well, this is like the Van Duel ships, we don't really have to worry about player usability because they're not going to be using them, and somewhere the communication was lost that no, 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 this is a an actual ship that's going to be a player ship from the get-go. Players own Van Duel ships, too, just to be correct. So, the whole idea of this, of this game, in terms of alien design and ship design, is that humans can eventually own anything. You can get into anything, you can pilot anything, and that includes any of the alien stuff from what we, we know. So that seems kind of a cop-out. They knew they were going to be selling it. What, why this didn't come to light earlier is I guess people just thought somebody else was solving the issue. I, I don't know. It's just another one of those sort of examples like, guys, another own goal, seriously. I mean, it's just tiny things, but this is like, this is a management sort of thing. If there's a problem in the pipeline somewhere, it needs to be caught. And I'm sure they're going to solve it, but this is just something else that they're going to have to go back to the concept artist, redo it, move something around, change something. People who are who love the silhouette are going to go, but I like the fact that the cockpit faced forward. And, you know, it's just this is the sort of thing that needs to be caught earlier. I agree. I agree. I mean, their ship pipeline should be able to absorb this, I think. And the way that they, they structure everything is the next step is where you go into gray boxing and white boxing or whatever. And they would have to redo half of this stuff anyway. None of the geometry that's there probably gets reused. It doesn't really slow them down from that point of view, but it, 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 it was probably the reason they did the sale and they probably they, they did the concept art is they needed to get it into the pipeline and Maybe the you know debating whether the arms should be swung back was just not high on their priority. Yeah, and this this bugs me too. Why put it on sale then? If they know that the finished product is not going to resemble this really much at all, why sell it? Well, it hasn't stopped them with half the other things. I mean, you saw how many ships grow in size or or change scope and stuff like that. That's just it's just part of the the way they do things. Um, and the fact that the concept sale is the beginning of the pipeline for most of these ships to justify, you know, some of the resources that are put into the ships, I guess. What, it's just the way that they, they, they've organized themselves. It's, it's part of the system. For any ship that's not part of Squadron 42, that has the exception, right? So and moving on to another topic real quick. Have you guys checked out any of the physical merchandise that SIG is starting to offer right now? I have not. So they, they're offering some new t-shirts and some baseball caps and like a military style hat and a new cool Terra mouse pad. But 
there happens to be some controversy going on. One of the interesting things that they did and is they in the past sales of physical merchandise, it was shipping was included with the items. And with the new system, shipping is now separate, which means that the prices being advertised are obviously much lower than they normally are. And you add shipping on at the end. And I guess what a lot of people didn't realize for I, maybe they, nobody has been ordering uh, physical merchandise, um, but all this stuff is shipped from China. It's direct ship. It's probably being produced on demand in a factory. They produce it and they immediately ship it out. And because under the old system that shipping was included in the, in the item, there was never way, any way to get group shipping or anything like that, right? It, because, and again, because I think it's all produced on demand, they're never going to have two items in the warehouse at the same time to group ship them anyway. Now, that wasn't a problem back then because it was obscured from the user. Right? They just felt that they thought that the item was being higher priced and that the shipping was was probably reasonable. And it comes to find out the items actually are pretty reasonably priced and we've just been paying an insane shipping cost on most of the stuff. And like you go to buy a $12 t-shirt and shipping is $8. Or you go buy a $20 mouse pad and the shipping is $15 or something like that. Uh, and it, it's making a lot of people mad. And the fact that you can't group any of the items together to sh save shipping is, again, the, the, the spawn of multiple Reddit threads. So, <laughs> Well, you know, the, the wrong shade of blue could be a spawn of a Reddit thread. Let's, uh, let's be realistic True. here. <laughs> That's supposed to be a darker blue, not that light blue stuff. So is there a particular solution or alternate plan that everyone sort of agrees is the way it should have been done? Or are people just now generally outraged at the fact that shipping from China is ridiculous? It's just certain people are mad. I think that's just pretty much it. And I think that's the way it will be. The uh, marketing team at um, SIG has made a deal with a Chinese manufacturer. It's probably the same guys they've used with everything. Uh, the whole business model is built around no no stock on hand. There's a, there's a name for just that. In time. Just well, in there's just time. Yeah. There's just in time production, but there's also just a resource light model where you have like Asset no light. warehouse. Asset light. There you yeah. go. You have no warehouse. You produce and you ship. And, th and they're getting the, obviously, they're getting the orders in advance. You don't get this stuff till months later anyway, half the time. Well, because, I mean, even though it's produced on demand, they, they'd have to wait for a certain number of orders to come through because I, run. I'm sure there's right. a there's a minimum run level, like you need to order 50 yeah. or 100 or 1,000 or something like that. Right. So, that yeah, you're right. So, they do the run and they ship the run and then they do the next run and then they ship the next run. They don't wait They don't wait around to group your three items that you bought together. There is no... Yeah. With, with the exception of some things they did in mass production, like the cards and the um, injection mold action figure guy. And, I think uh, the die cast metal, well, I think the die cast runs were also that way too. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the spaceship, the, the constellation, that was all pre run and that they, they carried stock for some of that stuff. For pretty much everything else, it was on demand. And this is obviously the way that they're, they're doing this and justifying this is it looks like it's all on demand. Yeah. I don't, I don't have that proof of that but that that seems like the obvious um, solution here physical merchandise is a is a, a tremendous pain and there is no good way to do it either you're going to absorb a bunch of risk by buying a bunch of stock you might not sell or you're going to inconvenience your customers by doing it this on demand way and they, they pay for the privilege it's there's no i mean and those of you who are watching the twitch stream now here's our handsome new you know guard frequency patch woohoo i mean that was an enormous pain in the butt and this is a two inch by four inch piece of thread uh, that I ordered from some people in New York who probably had it manufactured in China and shipped overseas. And, you know, a color was wrong, and so the pre-production patch had to be redone. And something I thought, you know, for our, for our first patch, it took about three weeks from start to finish. This one was more like eight weeks because of just the communication lags. And I, or I had to have a minimum order. I mean, I had to order a minimum number of them to get the price that I wanted. Um, and so the risk of dis disposing of them is on us, you know. And for us, we're not trying to make money off these or anything like that. We're not running a business here. They're just fun little souvenirs. Uh, and so I'll, we happily absorb that risk and it's fine. But for a company like CIG, they, you know, they don't, they need to make money on these sales. And the way that they're doing it is by, like Brian said, asset light. We're not taking any risk on this. This is basically, we are a, a through point through which customers funnel money. And then we take a piece of it and then ship the rest of it off to the people in China who actually have to fulfill the order. 
So, so uh, I've, I've actually talked to Sandy about this a little bit um, at Bar Citizen events, and she her answer to me, and actually Ben is the same way, they're not making any money off of this stuff. Or if they make any money, it's like a buck or two. It's, it, oh, yeah. It's, when it's I say, not a revenue stream for right, them. Right, right, right. When I say make money, I mean, I mean, I'm talking in terms of operational profit. They're not a clothing company. They're, right. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's yeah. not even like funding dollars, right, for really anything. No. The, the, the idea behind this physical merchandise is – uh, fan enablement, right? They're selling yeah, it to souvenir. you so that, you, yeah, it's a souvenir. It's, 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 they're selling it to you almost as a form of advertisement and right. they're putting their man hours into it and, and that's what they're getting back. Um, I'm personally not mad about any of this stuff. I understand why it is, but yeah. it's, it's easy to see why people would get bent out of shape in the community for paying basically 2x the, the of, of an item cost in order to get it to you. So just to be clear though, and again, people are getting mad about this stuff. There is no official statement from SIG on this. This is the my my explanation for why the prices and shipping are like that, or is my supposition based on conversations that I've had with them and my understanding of of how Chinese manufacturing work, which works, which which could be could be flawed, you know. Um, and so so to say, when you see people mad about this stuff, it's probably mostly because they don't understand how the business model is working for SIG and and how any of these uh, low-cost manufacturing things are even put together. This week's Star Citizen Community Question. Do the Defender or the Banu seem more appealing with the extra info that's been released? Share your position with us. Details to come. There was a brief but worrisome hiccup in the Elite world this week as the third-party developers who make tools and web pages for the game went on strike and took their sites down on Thursday in protest of their treatment by Frontier. This is their statement in part. We believe that our tools greatly enhance the game playing experience, and yet we are often feel that Frontier does not actively encourage the effort that goes into supporting their games with these tools. There is currently no easy way for us to request features and support that will benefit the community as a whole. And there is often no warning from Frontier when the game update will alter or break existing APIs that we rely on. This action was a huge statement because of the community event Elite had planned for the weekend of the 29th and 30th. The developers in question had originally planned for their strike to continue through the 30th. However, possible crisis was averted with a quick response from Frontier. Our research badgers weren't able to find any details, but Frontier apparently contacted the aggrieved developers and pledged to improved support and increased communication. The sites were restored shortly after the shutdown first started, and developers agreed that their concerns were heard. Frontier has also been working to quell some of the flames caused by the many bugs found in 2.3 with a series of small updates. Both 2.3.01, which was for all players, and 2.3.02, which is so far only for Mac and PC, dropped this week, heavily focused on fixing some of these issues, as well as bringing the promised increases to multi-crew payouts and reduced insurance costs for multi-crew helmsmen. Unfortunately, there was a serious issue at first with the engineers in 2.3.02, Occasionally, material components would be consumed with no resulting effect on the chosen module. This, however, has already been fixed as well. Several of the Lost Generation ships have been discovered so far, and efforts continue in-game as commanders search for any others that may still be out there. Each seems to be accompanied by interesting tidbits of lore and elite universe history, with Hyperion and Odysseus being the most recently found. All right. So there is about a million things going on with Elite Dangerous this week, and uh, Jace collated and grabbed all this stuff for us and, and put it together, but it doesn't, it barely scratching the surface. The out of game websites, those are huge in Elite. They do so much in the way of like planning your trade routes, figuring out what materials you have to collect to do the engineer recipes. I mean, I, I don't do a game session in Elite without using some of these websites. I mean, you just, it's just practically impossible to get stuff done without them. And f- folding that in with the big player event this weekend, there are people who are trying to get their ships geared up with those engineers to get ready for this thing. And then all of a sudden those websites went dark. So big PR problem. Uh, the, and apparently that, that fire was put out immediately by frontier. So uh, hats off to, uh, to Ed, the community manager out there, who apparently just a smooth-talking guy and uh, got everybody back on board. 
too sweet because uh, that could have been a disaster. So in the article, they mentioned that if you run a website that isn't already mentioned here, that you're supposed to email a link and they'll put you on some sort of list. Right. And that seems like the, the least transparent way of handling developers I've ever yeah. heard. I, I, sure. <clears throat> They need they need like a microsite or like a, just a blog or something like that that they talk about these things and, and solicit feedback for upcoming APIs and things like that. Uh, having a mail list, you know, for people that deal with it, I cringe at what what comes out of that. Yeah, well, it, see, and that's the thing too is it, is that this I think largely hinged on the personalities involved. Again, I don't I'm, I wasn't involved in this. I don't run any websites. I don't have any, you know, secret back channels to anybody, but just as an observer of the community, I honestly think that somebody uh, uh, inside Frontier pointed at the community manager Ed and said, "You're the face of this. Make them believe that we're going to make this okay somehow." Because as the two, as, as we've often in the show compared and contrasted the development model of Elite versus the development model of Star Citizen, you couldn't get more night and day between what they talk about before it goes live and what they just drop on patch day. There is a cone of silence around uh, Frontier that I think even this sharing of an email list for their API changes was probably a huge step for them. And the maximum pain that they felt as far as, oh, crap, this will be a complete boondoggle for us uh, at this big player event kind of is tarnished by the fact that these people that run these third-party websites are withholding service. Personalities won the day here in a way that might not have worked if the personalities are any different. You, you've got to wonder, though, if there wasn't sort of an anti-ed that caused this. I sincerely doubt it. I sin- and if there is an anti ed, his name is David Braben. I mean, that's the anti ed, and because it's his baby, right? I mean, he's this is this is his show, and he's developing his game the way he wants it developed. And that way is, we're going to do what we need to do to make our code run the way we want it to run, and you guys will just get it when it drops, and bugs and all, and we'll work to fix the bugs, and they do, and they've had a couple patches here that have fixed the most egregious, well, some of the most egregious ones. Uh, but, you know, I think this was a, I think even getting an email list is something of a victory for the developer community. And they've been, I mean, well, I, no, but that was, that was my point is I think that if it was Dave, then these developers have been banging their digital heads against the wall trying to get him to cave. And it, you know, Ed was the one that needed to step in and mediate. But, you know, as soon as the developers were able to deal with him instead of with, whoever was causing the massive roadblocks, everything got a lot smoother. I, again, I, I think the calling it a roadblock, I think it's the right concept because it just was like, it's like you're arguing with a rock. It's like, no, this is how we do development. It's like going to Bill Gates and asking him, hey, can I have can I have the secret sauce for Clippy? Would you send me the secret sauce for Clippy? Because I've got some ideas that he's going to be a stapler. They'll provide the APIs on their own time and in their own way, and you're going to get you know, whatever you get. When, when patch day comes, just, you know, you guys are third party folks, right? You're just, you're out there. You got no connection to us. You just take what we give you. I think that the message has been sent and received that no, everybody that plays the game seriously relies on those third party websites for their game sessions to an extent that you don't understand. And we, and they just sent the signal that mm, maybe now you do understand. Maybe you do. I, I'm sorry, Tony. I understand where you're going there, but. That was the worst example ever. I, I just gotta call you out on that. <laughs> Clippy? What, you don't like Clippy? Come on. Oh, I know. I, the fact that, that, micro, that Bill Gates probably doesn't care about Clippy and they don't use Clipper anymore. Well, they yeah. So, for well, Microsoft I'm, anymore. Yeah, well, you know, 20 years ago, 1987. I, 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 I'm trying to reach a diverse audience here, Brian. Come on, man. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to reach everybody. You might as well have brought up Microsoft Bob. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about Bob because of you, Jeff. <laughs> so, <laughs> that even predates. I mean, come on, that talk about you know, dated examples. I mean, that's from what two years before Clippy. I mean, two whole no, years. No, no, no. That's after. No, that was after Clippy. That was like Bob the millennium. 
Oh, yeah. it's even more obscure though. But, but, but <laughs> to get back on track, I'm, I'm wondering if all of these, all this brouhaha mm-hmm. uh, changes the way Frontier does business. I, I mean, I kept expecting that Star Citizen and all these other, you know, alpha level games that are, you know, in a deg- to a degree oversharing. Uh, I always expect, expected that to rub off on Frontier, and Frontier no. has been staunchly just in the mode of their newsletters and just yep. occasional post-launch uh, uh, live streams and things like that, and 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 they just never share more. There's never like more exposure to more of the developers. There's never more exposure to under the hood things like that. Well. You guys are, I think, are missing something here, too. I, I really do. Think about it. This is the first time that third-party web developers have held a game hostage. If you think about all the APIs that are out there for the various different games, like EA's uh, Battlefield or WoW or EVE Online or, I mean, all these all these. Uh, third-party developers that, that pull this data from the game source never have had this kind of action before. Yeah, but I think Elite is a unique example in that case because with most of the other games, that, like you mentioned, like Battlefield and, and WoW, a lot of the third-party APIs are classed under the nice-to-have category. Whereas in Elite, it's a lot of these things are, no, 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 you cannot actually play with any sort of efficiency or effectiveness unless you're using these things because they're items that the developers didn't bother to put in the game. Yeah. Features like recipes. Yeah. Right, but still, there's still the idea that a third party has put the game, the actual game on notice and said, look, we're just not going to stand for this lack of communication before. Yeah. It's changing the landscape in, in future games. Well, that, that, and that's because most of these third-party websites that games rely on, if they get irritated, they just close their doors. And then the game deals without them. Yeah. Right? And so it, it's good that Frontier is actually saying, okay, we'll talk to you guys. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really curious as to what the next steps are here and what they're actually giving these guys, whether they're actually going to change the APIs or give them advance notice and things like that. I strongly suspect that, and I'm, I'm, I may be giving the community manager more credit than maybe be than what he deserves, but I'm going to, I'm going to heap it on him anyway. Cause he, ta- he takes a lot of crap. I strongly suspect that Ed went around to individual programmers and said, Will you please just send me an email when you're about to change something and I will forward this to these guys? I think that's why there's not going to be a blog. I think that's why there's not going to be a portal. I think that's why, I think that's why it's going like this because Ed volunteered and probably went around physically to people's desks and said, Holy crap. We've been working on this in game event for weeks, months now, and these guys have a legit beef. And unless we do something on our own time with our own initiative, this is going to hurt. This is going to make the game look bad. It's bad. It's going to make us look bad. Help. Can you, can I, can you help me out? And I'm sure the individual programmer said, yeah, no problem. I'll email you when I make those changes. And I think that's probably, this is probably a very informal solution to a very formalistic, closed mouth development process that we've gotten used to with Elite. This is a back channel patch, so to speak, on that process. And I think that that's, it's going to, if, if people quit or move and decide they don't want to do that anymore, then it'll stop. Yeah, and I, it sounds like a recipe for failure to actually to meet the demands of these guys. I mean, well, like you said, if, if anything changes, or say they get a new community guy, or, or say uh, like, yeah. or, or, or say some guys like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot I changed that. Right? That's the and real then, trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, who, I mean. Yeah, I, who knows? I, I don't. I don't suspect it's the last we've seen of this, but it was a very positive development, and it defused a situation that could have been really bad. Because, and this is the other big news item: there's a big thing going on. Speaking of third-party developments, and uh, you know, not keeping things in house, this is a community event that's being run by an author that is connected to, but not really employed by Frontier, and he is writing a second book. And the ending of the book is going to depend on how this weekend's event goes. So just for the for the uninitiated out there, there has been a, 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 a character that was introduced in a, a, a novel when Elite was released. She's a muckety-muck in the Imperial stuff. 
big adventures, swords and gunfights and explosions and whatnot. She walks away from her throne and things and then has gone, went radio silent for about three years of in-game time. Well, now she's reappeared and she's got a big secret, quote, quote, big secret. And she has to get from a system out on the fringe to someplace in the core worlds. And in the game, the uh, major powers have all uh, issued bounties on her, kill on sight. And her and three co-pilots, three wingmates, uh, each have a, have this data or whatever that they're trying to get to get back to the core. If any one of the four makes it to the core, the big secret shall be revealed and the superpower shall be embarrassed and the plot shall move along. If all four of them die, then the information is lost. And so... Uh, there is a, you know, it's pretty high stakes as far as in-game lore goes, but it's not officially part of the game program, which makes this, again, a little weird. For this control freaky as Frontier is, they've sort of handed off a big chunk of that to this author, who has then turned around and handed it off to a bunch of griefers, gankers, PvP people, uh, and said, you know, kill me if you can. Uh, and I think that's absolutely fascinating. Oh, okay. So I, I was a bit confused by this event. So this is not actually sanctioned by Frontier? Oh, it is. It's sanctioned by Frontier, but it's not run by Frontier. Okay. So they, do they have any kind of special GME stuff nope. monitoring this at as all? Far as, as far as has been publicly related to us, the pilots are all just pilots. They have ships that are... Um, stock ships. ships, yep, and they're, they're just plain old stock ships. There's no god button on them. They've been, they've used the engineers a little bit, but not anywhere near to the extent that you know uh, people do to get good PvP builds out of them. So, I mean, these these people are mortal and vulnerable. And so, I've been involved a little bit on the uh, the Discord channel that was set up to sort of be an unofficial protector group. And holy God, there's like there were, we I was involved in a training exercise that was probably over a hundred people on a single Discord channel, and that was just the training session. They have they say they have approximately twenty times that number of people signed up. Now, who, now do people show up? Who knows? But even that kind of interest is going to melt servers. Uh, I think as everyone tries to get into instances where twenty people in an instance is crowded uh, and, and problematic. So. Yeah, we're t we're talking like verging on those videos they showed of the huge wars that happened in Eve when it's like, okay, yeah, everyone's ship moves once every 10 minutes because of the temporal slowdown mechanic they use in that game. Yeah, there's no such thing in Elite. Yeah, so if it does get that big, I expect we're going to hear about some server issues. Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, the, we'll, the, we're, we're going to find out exactly what this thing is made of. And I think, and honestly, I think that that frontier's happy about that because I mean, you know, let's see what this baby can do, and let's break some stuff. And I think that that's good. I mean, it, it, the community is involved in it. There, are, I went confession time. Jeff, you're gonna be mad at me. I went out and PvP some. I did. I made. I've, I've made. Why a, would I be mad? I've at made you a for PvP that? build, Jeff. Jeff, I tried. I tried to kill people. I did. Tony, Tony, Tony. I know, I know. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. No, but I mean, th there are plenty of people out there, and you know, they're, they they'll rip your throat out if they if they uh, catch you unawares uh, in in open play. But they're also extremely helpful in telling you exactly how they ripped your throat out, and they're happy to share with you exactly what you need to do to be able to rip other people's throats out, because they think that that's fun. And they want other people to have the same kind of fun that they do. So I got lots of people freely sharing tips, happy to uh, do test runs with you and, and stop firing at you when your hull hits 50% so you don't actually die. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, there's the, they're the people that make you have no fun. But if you talk to them in the Discord channels, go to their uh, websites and learn some of the stuff, very helpful They've been super nice to all the noobs like me that have, uh, you know, just sort of shown up and gone, well, do I, I'd like to try this out. And it's been, I think this event is going to really, really boost uh, a, a community sense in Elite that fleets might not and guilds might not. Because once you get in a fleet or a guild, you're very isolated and kind of in your own corner of the universe. But this has been a really open and widely shared thing. Hopefully it goes well. We're going to find out if it sucks tomorrow. Uh, so by get, by the time you guys get this episode downloaded, it will either have been pretty awesome or a really terrible thing. 
Or a non-thing, if all the servers just grind to a halt. They, they could. I could be winding up in my own little instance with, with nobody there, all by my lonesome. Like, this is no fun at all. <laughs> or the, the pilots for the named characters going, well, this is really easy because there's <laughs> literally no one else in the galaxy trying to stop That's right. This. That's right. They, no one can get a connection. I just jump into my own instance. Boom, 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 boom. Our Elite Dangerous community question. Do you have any thoughts on the strike and how things will move forward from here? Also, there's a big community event happening after this recording's done, so share your stories about these items through our usual contact methods. Details coming after feedback. But now, it's time for news we didn't use. CIG has released updates for their 3.0 production schedule. Frontier has announced a legendary version of the game being offered for sale later this year. Its content is the same as the Commander Deluxe Edition, but the legendary version will be a physical product. Infinity Battlescape developers have finished programming Steam integration for the game, though they indicate they won't actually be going through Steam until at least the beta. This week's Around the Verse show focused on the Frankfurt Studios' development efforts as well as an interview with the QA team. Announced a while ago, the Dual Universe Alpha is tentatively scheduled for September of 2017. Now that we're all cut up with the latest news, let's tune into the feedback loop and let you join in on the conversation. Okay, buddy, what's on your mind? We're all friendly! So let's just be friendly! Some say he's the father of all the dad jokes, and that's halfway to a temporal paradox. But all we know is he's called the Shiv, and he helped put together this week's feedback. Recap of last week's community questions. First, Star Citizen, question one, what's your opinion on the referral contest? Are you going to make an extra effort to recruit some friends? Star Citizen community question two was, do you like the lore that CIG revealed for the Banu, and are you going to be shelling out for a defender? For Elite Dangerous, do the coming changes do enough to make multi-crew a worthwhile experience? What's your take on the player participation lore event? Shadow703793 wrote in and said, Referral. Very negative. This really shouldn't have happened right now. They should have waited for 3.0 to release before doing this. As far as the Banu, I like it. I was thinking they would be more like the Ferengi, but the part about sharing blueprints is so not very Ferengi-like then. I'm glad they didn't just make a copy of the Ferengi. And no, not buying a Defender. Sean Newboy writes in and says, CQ1... Don't care and no. CQ2, love it and insert heartfelt laughter. Love the show, everyone. The infinitely lovable Angry Peas says, The contest feels like trying to sell popcorn as a Cub Scout all over again, but less fun and less successful. Yay, Banu! And Ken from Chicago, in one of two pieces of feedback he gave us, said, It wasn't until you discussed it that I saw the referral contest is for live streamers, not me, so I can avoid frustration by trying to win. Wow, that Cub Scout thing hurts. <laughs> that, that one felt physically painful to me because I did that and I hated it. I, I do that every year with my boys and oh my god now that he says it the it, it feels right yeah it feels yeah. it feels just as painful i feel like i'm standing in the hot sun in front of a uh, grocery store trying to sell popcorn oh. uh, using my using my kid as bait yeah that it's just uh i th- what i can't remember there was one other thing i did as a kid it was even worse than that it was trash bags i don't remember what thing we were raising money for for that but we were trying to sell trash bags which i thought was i mean i was eight or nine and i thought this is the dumbest idea ever popcorn is smarter than this is what i thought i, I listened to you guys uh, to discussion last week it, it is it's a live stream it's a live streamer bait thing uh they're just trying to you know get get another amplifier going and it seemed like they should have 3.0 out i, I completely agree there it's even not even just live streamers. It's like a certain brain. It's like specifically YouTubers because live streamers typically only get a following of a couple of hundred core people. 
right? And maybe they have a thousand followers or something like that, but they don't get quite the numbers that we're talking about here. This is really almost exclusively YouTubers and YouTubers pushing it to new people, like trying to get in people that aren't already YouTubing about Star Citizen to get them to YouTube about Star Citizen. Yeah. Yeah, the contest is really skewed. I, I, it really is. And, I, and if CIG can't really see that, then, you know, that's sad for them. Yeah, you know, you think about a product, you know, uh, no one, someone's got, we're going to get angry letters about this and I won't be here next week and you guys can deal with it. Haha. So here's about, here's what I'm going to say. Like, like if you, if it's like an Amway thing or like a, like a, what's that, the Herbalife thing? Tupperware. Yeah, Tupperware. Avon. Let's, let's, let, we'll get, we'll go to the more, you know, reputable end of this market. If you're trying to get an army of people to sell a little bit of your product each and, and just, and march it out there, you have, tiers which reflect that they're low and they're incremental and diminishing returns kick in way way down the road so you have a you have a five and a 10 and a 20 and a 30 and a 50 and a 70 and then when you get to the thousands then you start having those big steps you know 1000 10000 100000 it just seems like when they did the math for this they weren't really thinking about a Tupperware party, they're like Brian said, they want people with 5 million regular YouTube video subscribers to pick up that Star Citizen torch and get 0.1% of that audience to pony up. That's what they're go- they're aiming for 0.1% of 5 million viewers. That's what they're going for with this. And that that's fine, but it seems pretty counterintuitive as to what has worked for the game. What what did work from the game from say 2012 to 2014. In general feedback, Rambus said, The opening made my cry of laughter. Ken from Chicago says, Course at Robert Space Industries UK studio makes big ships. England had a naval empire that spanned the globe. Natch Brit ships are big. Our new Patreon this week is Bull Wraith. Yay! Hey, Patreon people, guess what? As you might have heard me mention earlier, we have new patches, and details on how you can get them will be forthcoming, and they're awesome. They're shiny. And in this week's community questions, do the Defender or the Banu seem more appealing with the extra info that's been released? Do you have any thoughts on the strike and how things move forward from here? Also, there's a big community event happening after this recording's done. Drop us an email, a tweet, or a comment on our show post, which you can find on our website and over on our Facebook page. So, how is the show? Are we communicating freely and in a timely manner, or do you think a strike is in order? Either way, let us know. Here's how you can get in touch with us. Why not leave us a comment on this show's post over at GuardFrequency.com? Or hit us up on Twitter at GuardFreak and leave a comment and like us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash GuardFreak. You can also use the contact form on our website and all the details for all the ways you can get in touch with us can be found in the show notes. Your feedback is an important part of what we do, so take a minute and tell us what's on your mind. And that brings us to the end of episode 166 of Guard Frequency. We'll be back with episode 167 on May 9th. So be sure to keep an eye out for our shows over at GuardFrequency.com. But that's not all. You can also subscribe to our shows at feeds.guardfrequency.com or search for us on iTunes. And if you're not doing anything Friday nights, then you should come and join us at 10 p.m. Central as we record Guard Frequency Live over at guardfrequency.com forward slash live. Our audio is also streamed on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash guardfreak. Do you like what we do? Want to help us make the best damn space sim podcast ever? Drop us an email to squawk at guardfrequency.com. And you can also support our show by visiting our website, clicking on the Patreon logo, and becoming a regular subscriber. For just $1.25 a week, you'll get access to the raw recordings of our live show, some Guard Frequency goodies, and an invitation to our private Elite Dangerous Flight Group. We want to thank all of our Patreons who support us with their subscriptions week on week and hope you'll consider making a regular contribution. Because the more support we get, the better show we can make. Hey. Hey, you. Are you looking for a friendly wingman or two? Well, we're active in most space sims and would love to have you come join us. Check out our website and look under Call Signs section for details on how you can fly with us. And don't forget about our sister production, Priority One. They cover all things Star Trek, from the TV series to the MMO, the novels, the movies, and everything in between. Be sure to check them out over at PriorityOnePodcast.com. 
We'd like to thank the entire team at Guard Frequency and the Priority One Network. Thanks to our community manager, Justin Chivalry Beam Lowmaster, our artists, Ben DeSanders and Simon Charlton Edwards, our staff writer, Jace Pentad, and of course, our audio engineer, Mikey. Thanks to our syndication partner, The Bass, and a special thanks to Ronald Jenkins for his permission to use his music in our show. Visit ronaldjenkins.com for more of his work. But above all, we especially want to thank you folks for tuning in. If no one's listening out there, the deep black gets pretty low. Reduce thrust. 7700. Stay on the guard. Apparently, the proximity and number of potentially habitable planets in Trappist 1 allows for the process called fast litho pens. Oh, God, you guys. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> fast litho panspermia. What was the name of that ship that we kept making fun of? <laughs> oh, the. Um, oh, I can't remember now. Name escapes me. The one with the name that we always, we always uh, make fun of. Right. I'm going to need a little more. Yes. Not Bodie McBoatface. There was another, there was like one was like, it was, um, I, I, it's almost a swear. What was the name of the damn word? Uh, I don't know. It'll come to me later. Yeah. Well, that was a good radio. <laughs> Keep all of that in. That's right. <laughs> My God. That was, that was, that was guard frequency gold right there. <laughs> yeah. And in this week's community questions, do the defender. Hold. What? In the meantime, we should whistle some sort of song. The cat came back the very next day. <laughs> no, I'm done. <laughs> Come on now. We're, this guard frequency is a world into itself. You know, we're a bubble of space time that floats hither and yon. Jeff? Jeff oh, tired. his mic's off. Oh, is it? His, his mic's muted. Jeff, your mic is muted. We can't hear a thing you're saying. Sorry about that. I didn't even notice. There must have been some background keystroke or something that did that. Uh, Audacity caught it because I was watching the Audacity. So okay, um, or it. hit us up on. Huh? Sorry. What? Sorry. I'll shut up now. <laughs> yes, please do. Wrong. Wrong. All of that is wrong.